Hello, and thanks for joining us on behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network. Welcome to our webinar on integrating sustainability into daily decision making. My name is Tess Clark. I work here at the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center, and we have some fantastic speakers lined up for you. But first, there are a few logistics and housekeeping items that we need to cover. So first, everyone will be on mute just to ensure audio quality. If you have a question, just type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box anytime throughout the session. All of the questions will be reserved for a Q&A at the end, but please feel free to send questions at any time. We will be posting the presentations from today as well as a video recording on our website. You can reach that website at www.efcnetwork.org. All of our webinars can be found under the Past Events tab, and we will post a recording of today's webinar and the presentation slides as soon as we can after the broadcast. And also, we will send you a link to those materials in a follow-up email in just a few days. All right, we do not submit our webinars to licensing agencies for pre-approval of continuing education credits. We do send certificates of attendance as a courtesy. So if you've joined this webinar with the intention of using it to support PDH or CEU hours, please know that we can only supply certificates after we verify attendance. It can take one to two weeks to send out certificates and you must attend the entire webinar to receive one. You must join the webinar using the unique join link that you received when you registered and you must be viewing the slides and listening to the audio. Again, we can't guarantee that this webinar will meet requirements for specific CEU or license renewal needs. Uh, and if you have other questions about this, you can email us at smallsystems at syr.edu, which you can see on the screen here. All right, now for a little bit about us. The Environmental Finance Center Network provides training and technical assistance to small public water systems in all US states and territories to help local systems achieve their goals and stay in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. And as you might guess, the EFCN is a university-based network. You can see a list of all of our network members here. We work together to create solutions to difficult how to pay issues of environmental protection and improvement. All right, on that note, I'd like to introduce my colleague Brandy Espinola from the University of Maryland Environmental Finance Center. And Brandy will be sharing the agenda for today and also introducing our speaker. So welcome, Brandy. Thank you, Tess, for that kind introduction. Um, for those of you who just joined, my name is Brandy Espinola. I work at the Environmental Finance Center at the University of Maryland. And so as Tess mentioned, EFC UMD is one of 10 sister centers across the country providing communities like your own with the tools and information necessary to manage change for a healthy environment and enhance quality of life. Um, this program offers a free annual training and technical assistance for small water systems in every state across the country. And as the different areas of expertise which we provide training on range from asset management to fiscal planning and even workforce development. So today's webinar will be focusing specifically on integrating sustainability into daily decision making. Um, ne next slide. But first we will hear, so first we'll hear today from Mary Tiger on how the Orange Water and Sewer Authority in Caribou, North Carolina has developed sustainability criteria to help evaluate projects in order to inform their decision making process. Uh, she'll also share lessons learned on how small utilities can integrate uh, some of these strategies into their own processes. Uh, we will follow that up with a couple case studies about how um, you can use various frameworks and resources that um, can be used to help integrate sustainability into your own decision-making processes. And then lastly, we'll have a Q&A session. So please feel free to type your questions into the chat box throughout the presentation, and we will make sure to answer those questions at the end of both of the presentations. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Mary Tiger. Mary is a results-oriented leader in local government with over 13 years of experience in project management, financial analysis, and delivery. Uh, over the past four years, Mary has been with the, the sustainability manager for the Orange Water and Sewer Authority in North Carolina, where she works to incorporate what she refers to as the triple bottom line into the utilities operations. And so from implementing to energy management strategies, she basically wears so many hats, her experience is gonna be incredibly valuable and we are looking forward to hearing from her. So Mary. All right, thank you, Brandy. Uh, nice to be here with you all today and I'm excited to talk to you about integrating sustainability into decision making and how, how we do it at OWASA 
Um, I am the sustainability manager for the Orange Water and Sewer Authority. Uh, a little bit about who we are. So OWASA is a public nonprofit agency that provides water, sewer, and reclaimed water services to Carborough Chapel Hill community in North Carolina. Uh, our biggest customer is the University of North Carolina, where a sister center to um, the Syracuse and Maryland EFC is located. We serve a population of a little over 80,000. Um, we have um, a little over 20,000 customer accounts. So we're not a, a small system by any means, um, but we're not huge either. Um, our annual revenues are about $39 million. We have 130 um, staff, uh, everything from a, a, a lake warden that's you know, monitoring our, our reservoirs to operators, distribution and collection staff. Um, we're kind of um, we're a special unit of government, so we even have our own HR IT department. We're not part of a local government. Um, again, the University of North Carolina is our largest largest water customer, um, and we have over 700 miles of underground pipe. A few little fun facts. So I just like to talk about sustainability um, with and start off with a definition because it really means so much to so many people. The uh, the term's been used a lot, um, so I think it's helpful to start off by talking about, you know, what are what is what do we really mean by sustainability? So it's a noun. That's a good place to start. Um, the Urban Dictionary defines sustainability as a hippy dippy cosmic cupcake term loosely applied to just about everything. Um, it goes on to use a few expletives. Um, and, and I'll be honest, some days it feels like that. Uh, I always say that it, sustainability at OWASA is interpreted very holistically, um, which means I kind of get involved in a lot of stuff. Um, but that's also really good because it means that, you know, we're kind of embedding that uh, triple bottom line decision making into a lot of decisions across the organization. And I think you'll see, you know, as a few examples that I bring to you today, how that's kind of baked in. So it's not just me as a sustainability manager that's doing it, uh, but we're really trying to spread that across the organization. The Oxford Dictionary defines sustainability as the ability to be maintained at a certain level. Uh, to me, how this reads is survival um, and, and nothing more. The United Nations has kind of amplify that definition to say that sustainability is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And incorporating that, I hear a lot more about thriving. It's not just about surviving, making sure that your organization is around um, for years to come and resilient to whatever might come down the pipeline, financial, weather, uh, demographic challenges that you might deal with, um, but the, you're really quite resilient to it and you're thriving in that space. Um, this is me and my two daughters. And I think for a long, before I had them, I was fine with the survival, um, the survival definition. Like we're gonna be around, uh, certainly as a water utility, you know, you're a, a, a government monopoly. Many of us are not, are not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, but by embedding sustainability into our decision-making, we're making sure that we're thriving our communities, our organizations are thriving for future generations. So those are the, that's the future generation that I care about. We've said, thrown around the term a couple of times, the triple bottom line. Um, and, and this is typically what's meant by that. Um, these are the, the three bottom lines. So prosperity um, is, is the one that we all kind of hold ourselves to and, you know, financial sustainability and making sure that we're, financially prosperous. Um, the other two legs of the stool, if you will, uh, one is the planet. So thinking about the, um, the impact that our decisions, our projects have on the environment, um, how they engage with that environment, and then people. So how our projects affect the communities that we serve, the people that we work with. Um, so really kind of that, that societal impact. 
Um, so those are the, the, I call them the three P's. So we're a wastewater utility as well. So my daughter likes to say, you do pee and poop. So um, <laughs> you work in pee and poop. So that those that's the two P's she thinks that I work with. These are my three P's. And I, I'll add a fourth P to it, which is partnership. So uh, bring in a couple examples here where partnership uh, around a sustainability project really helped it even move. Um, it's it's really critical um, to making sure that projects are sustainable that um, and, and are moving forward in a sustainable way. So I have a couple examples to bring uh, for you all today. Um, and I'm going to relate them to different types of decision making that that utilities are making. Um, so one is just kind of programmatic design and implementation. And the example there is our energy management program which in and of itself is kind of a sustainability initiative, but I really want to focus on kind of the program itself and how we have kind of baked into that program um, a way to evaluate projects against that triple bottom line or quadruple bottom line, if you will. Um, the second example I want to bring to you is about operational decision making. So, and, and this particular project is our how, what we decided to do with our biosolids management. Uh, we were at a critical decision point about four years ago, and, um, and, and we worked with our board and our community and our staff through a triple bottom line analysis of, of what to do. And then the third project I want to talk to you about is our reclaimed water system, which is a capital project, and show how, um, you know, really partnership and that in that instance to help to really push move forward a sustainability project i'm not going to talk about as much the long-range water supply plan which we're in the midst of um, but i bring it here only to acknowledge that you know when when as a utility we're doing you know plans that are 50 years you know we're, we're looking far ahead it's a great opportunity to to bring in um, multiple criteria um, and evaluation and, and to think about more, try to expand thinking beyond just the, the financial bottom line. So the first program I want to talk to you about is our, our energy management program. So in, in 2015, our board of directors, so we're governed by a board of directors that's appointed by um, various elected official boards in the community. Um, so we have a board of directors of nine, and they set energy management goals for the organization. And they, they asked us to reduce our use of purchased electricity by 35% by 2022 uh, against a 2010 baseline. They asked us to reduce our use of purchased natural gas by 5% by 2020. And they also asked us to beneficially use all our wastewater treatment plant biogas, um, provided the preferred strategy is was projected to have a positive payback within the expected useful life of the required equipment. That's a mouthful, but just making sure that it wasn't a, a you know, it's not a boondoggle project, but not looking for some sort of quick payback on, on any kind of investment there. So we had, as an organization, already made quite significant strides towards managing our energy. We had variable frequency drives um, associated with most pumps that it made sense to have them there. Um, we had already invested in um, a high efficiency blower and aeration system at our wastewater treatment plant, which is really our energy, was our energy hog before. Um, and so we'd made some, some great advancements with that. So we knew that we needed um, a, a kind of comprehensive program to identify, evaluate, and pursue energy projects and we developed um, our own kind of in-house energy management program. Oh, hi Bridget, how are you? Oh, sorry, someone's talking on the yeah. phone. Mike, I think we can hear you. <laughs> um, for each of the energy projects that we identify and there it's really somewhat organic. So, really no, so I just sent Patrick all that information. Um, do you, know, you know Patrick, right? Oh, okay. Mike, you probably want to mute your phone. Sorry, or someone needs to mute their phone. So for the projects that we identify, and they come from across the organization, we encourage 
uh, community members, board members, operators, um, maintenance staff to identify areas where we can save energy. And then we run them through this kind of high level of evaluation criteria to determine whether they're worth e any more investigation. Um, and so we think about them from these six different angles. Uh, is it financially responsible? Is it realistic? What are the operational impacts? Uh, what's the act, you know, what's the potential energy and carbon emission reduction potential? Does it coordinate with any other projects that are going on and what are the community impacts? So just you know, kind of walking through each one of these, um, with financially responsible, um, one of the things that we think about um, is you know, we look at other cases, has this particular project been viable in other communities, and is there an opportunity to get some outside funding? So our energy provider provides um, for rebates for some energy efficiency projects, um, and then there's um, state revolving fund money that can be made available at 0% interest for greener projects. So we just, at a high level, think about, is, is this likely to be a good um, uh, investment of our ratepayer funds? Then we think about, is it realistic and implementable? Do we really have the capacity to take it on? Is it currently legal? That seems like an obvious one, but a good one to kind of discuss a little bit. Uh, and you know, are there good examples of where this has been done in the past? Um, we like to be uh, progressive and we like to be on the cutting edge, but we always say we don't like to be on the bleeding edge. So we're typically looking for other examples where where a project has, has been um, successful. And then we think about our operational impact. So this is a really important one just to kind of get buy-in on these projects is, does it help the people that are in the plant every day or out in the field every day? Uh, you know, is this kind of investment gonna help? Um, LED lights are a great example of that. You know, our maintenance team really likes LED lights because it means that they don't have to get out there and replace um, these bulbs so frequently, particularly when they're in dangerous high places. Um, so we think about the impact on safety, comfort, productivity. Uh, would, would a certain strategy help resolve an existing or an expected problem? Sometimes that we come across that with HVAC projects as, you know, people are uncomfortable anyway, so it's an opportunity to embed energy efficiency into an upgrade that, that needed to take place. Um, certainly, you know, just the potential to reduce our energy use. If it's not something that's, if it's a small pump station out on the edge of the service area that doesn't really demand a lot, it's probably not worth our, um, it, it's certainly not gonna get prioritized over some um, of our larger pumps and, and larger energy using functions. Coordinating it with, with other projects um, to increase the potential to save energy. Do we have something in the capital program where we could kind of get in there um, and improve everything you know, at once and take advantage of economies of scale to save money and our staff time? And then community impacts. Is it something that our community is gonna get excited about or does it coordinate with something? So none of this is really qualitative in nature. There's not a lot of numbers behind this. It really just takes our team sitting down, taking each strategy and generally comparing it against this framework. Um, and then when we step back and look, and I, and I bring you this grid not for you to necessarily read it or anything, but you'll see in other examples, we have this color coding system with this framework um, that allows you to, um, it, you know, if you're implementing it, to step back and look and, at the bigger picture of how these projects compare against multi, you know, multiple criteria. Um, and it's also a great communication tool. So then you can, you can start to justify why you would do one project over another, or why you would recommend something against the status quo because you can see that that color coding, and when you're talking about dealing with uh, policymakers, you know they're they're just not in in the weeds, and uh, you probably don't want them in the weeds as much. <laughs> it's good to to make things kind of you know you can glance at it and understand it. Um, we do, you know, we kind of use this framework for our energy program to um, decide whether we're going to implement a project, whether we're going to study it further. 
is it something that it's probably a good idea, but not worth getting into a system by itself? Um, in which case we would defer until we are upgrading that certain piece of equipment um, or defer indefinitely. We don't, we don't live in a great place for wind, um, particularly like large wind turbines. So that was a renewable energy strategy that was evaluated and pretty quickly ruled out. It's just not, you know, you, you line it up against those criteria and we're, we can pretty much say we're going to defer that project indefinitely. So it just allows us to kind of quickly sort through um, a number of ideas. For those projects that, that we're going to move forward with, we do move into a business case evaluation um, to decide if it is, a, is actually a good use of, of ratepayer funds. There are that, that top um, line there talks about some capital projects. So there are some projects that are not driven by energy savings alone, but which we flag as having the potential to reduce energy use, like our Cane Creek pump station improvement. That's one. We're doing that project for other reasons, but it's a good one to flag and maybe add energy savings as a secondary objective um, onto that project. But for those like rooftop solar panel installation, we're going to run that through um, a, a more detailed life cycle cost analysis uh, where we're looking at that project over the whole life of the asset and taking into account, you know, design construction costs, what's the avoided cost of energy now and in years to come, you know, making sure that we're accounting for the cost of operating and maintaining that, uh, that we're exploring any utility rebates and other incentives. And then um, this is not necessarily going to be the case in every community, I realize, but our board has said we want to look at these projects with and without accounting for the social cost of carbon, which is the um, it's an economic evaluation of what the cost of carbon emissions are to um, society. Uh, what are the what are going to be the costs of climate change to agriculture, public health? Uh, infrastructure and the um, federal interagency task force I think in 2015 made some projections for that um, so we use that number that they've made and we count it as a revenue for the project and it, it pushes some over the line of a, of a decent payback and so at that point it really becomes a policy decision for our board to say is this something that we want to spend money on or not and I say that you know, acknowledging that not every community is going to going to do that, but it is a way to kind of take credit for some of the um, the carbon emission reductions that these projects have. Um, we're doing pretty good. Um, we have reduced our purchase of electricity uh, by 29 percent, and we've reduced our use of natural gas by 41 percent um, for overall 40 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we've pretty much upgraded all of our lights to LED. We are we have a comprehensive HVAC upgrade system, and we're going through pump stations, pump station by pump station, and looking um, at you know ways that we can improve the efficiency not just of the equipment, but in how we operate those pump stations. Um, and we're avoiding about four hundred thousand dollars in um, purchased energy every year. Um, but one thing that's really that has been you know, relatively low cost is thinking about embedding you know, energy minded decision making into the organization. So getting data in front of our operators and our maintenance staff about energy so that they can consider that um, as they're you know, replacing small motors or operating a pump station, deciding which pump to operate. Um, I mentioned the capital projects that we're, you know, flagging as, you know, not every capital project that we pursue is a good energy project, but some of them are, and so we just flag energy as a, um, as a potential, um, you know, opportunity to save energy, and then uh, bring our bio. Go ahead. Sorry, I thought I heard somebody interrupting. Um, our biogas to boiler restoration. So we um, we burn about half of our biogas in the boilers that are used to reheat our anaerobic digesters at the wastewater treatment plant. And that system had been down for a long time. And um, 
and by getting everyone kind of rallied behind the, the goal to reduce our use of purchase natural gas, uh, we were able to get that system restored and up and running, and, um, and that's been really significant at reducing our use of purchase natural gas. In terms of embedding energy into daily decision making, we have a KPI metric around energy use that keeps that measurement in front of our board, in front of our senior staff. Um, we are pulling energy data into SCADA so that our operators are seeing that, you know, how much the, the plant, how much energy the plant used yesterday, how much is it using today, what are the on-peak hours, what are the off-peak hours. Um, we have a, a dashboard where we make our monthly billing data available to everybody so that they can look at that um, data and incorporate it into their budgeting and their decision making. And then this is a screenshot of a tool that we're using in our finished water pump station. Um, it's a specific energy dashboard. This is a third party product, but that what they have done is taken every single pump that we have at our, at our finished water pump station and the combinations of pumps. And then it informs us what the kilowatt hours per million gallons are for all of those different combinations. So it really tells us how to operate our pump station in the most efficient manner. And this is really actionable information for our operators. Um, they can actually, you know, they can see, oh, if I turn up pump four, you know, if we wanna get more flow out of the finished water treatment plant, it's better to use a combination of pump four and pump seven than to go to pump six, which is what they had done before. So thinking about how you can get that data in front of folks to, to really be actionable. The, um, the second kind of, you know, the operational decision making and how have we embedded sustainability into operational decision making. Um, I mentioned that about four years ago, we were at a um, critical point of deciding what to do with our, um, our biosolids, um, which are, um, you all probably know are generated as a byproduct of the, the wastewater treatment process. So we were, um, we were taking about half of our biosolids and applying it as a liquid, you know, liquid um, fertilizer to local farms, and we were dewatering about half of it and taking it down to a local compost facility. And there wasn't a lot of strategy behind it. It was just kind of what, you know, it, it was the way that we, that we managed the system. So we knew, you know, we really needed to look at this in a strate from a strategic perspective. What did, what did we really need to be doing? Um, and we ended up taking this triple bottom line evaluation approach. And these are the criteria that we used and wanted to think about, um, you know, compare each option to. So we were looking at everything from going to 100% dewatering to 100% uh, liquid land application and then variations in between. Um, and so for the social performance, uh, we were looking at, you know, what is the difference between all of these different options of the safety of our employees, compliance with public health standards, what's the impact on odor, dust, and noise, uh, what is the effect on farmers, so we have farmers enrolled in our liquid land application program, and we actually apply our uh, liquid biosolids for free on their land, um, uh, and so what, what's the effect on them? And then what's the effect on our employees? That's the kind of the, the people part of that Venn diagram. Uh, the planet part of the, the diagram, the environmental performance, we wanted to compare each option against, you know, compliance with environmental standards. Is it a reliable removal of biosolids from the wastewater treatment plant? What are the energy use in greenhouse gas emissions? And ultimately, does it beneficially recycle 100% of the biosolids? And then from that prosperity, we were looking at each of these projects, um, their life cycle costs, proven and reliable strategy at our scale. Um, is this strategy flexible and adaptive to changing conditions? So that kind of started to capture some of the unanticipated costs that we may not have known. And ultimately, is it a cost-effective and balanced program? We pull them in, so the, the, the real fancy tool that we have is Excel. <laughs> we um, organize the criteria, as you saw with the energy projects, the criteria on um, uh, you know, going down the rows of the criteria and the columns are the different options. And then we call it our, our shades of green table. And 
on a very um, kind of qualitative basis where we are taking notes in the, each cell of how each strategy lines up against the criteria and then we're saying yeah this this is the best one for effect on farmers and this one's better you know than the status quo um, but it's not the best that's a lighter shade of green this one's acceptable like it's not um, it's not a deal killer, but it's not great. And then red, a red cell would be completely unacceptable. So again, you start to we, um, create this gradation so you can pull back and really look at this relative comparison of each different strategy. So again, I don't, I don't bring you this table for you to, to read it necessarily. Um, I don't know that you can really, except to see that, again, those criteria are on the left side. And then our different options for how we wanted to manage or we were considering to manage our um, biosolids is, is across the top. And you can see none of these options have um, are unacceptable against any strategy. So that's good. That's a good starting point. When you pull back and you look at this table, um, the most green column is 100% cake to McGill. So that's 100% dewatered biosolids taken to are um, the composting facility. And so this was ultimately where staff thought that, that we were gonna go. Um, that was, that's the greenest column, uh, most sustainable against all of these criteria. Uh, it's interesting how things play out um, politically um, and decision-making. I mean, you know, I think we look at our role as staff is to just give the information in the most clear, concise, um, an accurate way to our policymakers so that they can make the decisions. They they ended up going with um, a 75% liquid to farms by Owasa and 25% cake to McGill, so that third column there. And the factor that really drove it home was this effect on farmers. Um, a lot of the partners that we had, the farmer partners that we had came out in strong support of our liquid land application program. And um, that that was a strong enough signal to our board, you know, that we wanted to actually ramp up our liquid land application um, to support local agriculture. So we didn't end up going with the most green column, but um, but you can start to see how maybe some of these criteria um, are weighed more than others. The last project I want to talk about is like as a capital project, and that's the uh, reclaimed water system, uh, which is really a good example of a partnership with the University of North Carolina. Um, so we have at our at our wastewater treatment plant, we divert an average of about 800,000 gallons per day um, and we pump it back up to the University of North Carolina and they use over 90% of that reclaimed water um, as evaporative cooling water in their chillers. They use some of it for irrigation purposes, and then they use a portion to flush toilets. So obviously with, with use in the chillers, our demands are much higher in the summer uh, and, and lower in the winter on this system. The, the reclaimed water system was brought online in about 2009, um, but the ball started rolling on this project um, in 2003, 2004, following a drought of record that we had here um, in North Carolina, in the North Carolina Piedmont. And it was that drought of record that really gave the university pause um, when we enacted some, some pretty hefty restrictions on the community and they started thinking about their resiliency as an organization um, to, to operate during these types of droughts. And so they started the, the conversation with OWASA about, you know, hey, what about reclaimed water? Um, and as we worked through, um, you know, thinking about the benefits of this system, uh, we thought about the benefits of it uh, for OWASA, we thought about it, the benefits for the whole community, and then thought about it from the benefits of, um, of the university. And, you know, ultimately help, you know, this type of project would help reduce the entire community's risk for drought. Um, it would save drinking water for human use. Um, Reuse supply is less vulnerable to drought, so it increases the resiliency of the university. It's a locally controlled source. 
Um, it has helped to reduce the discharge of nutrients from our wastewater treatment plant. That was not necessarily a benefit that we that was readily obvious when we were going into it, from what I understand. Um, it was a sustainable management strategy and ultimately a, a cost-effective water source uh, for the university. So there, you know, again, against multiple criteria, um, it, it, it hit a lot of those, those high notes. Uh, this is just a, a trend of our um, of our water sales since 1980, and you can see our our demands have um, stabilized. But with the um, with bringing on the reclaimed water system in, in 2009, um, you know quite a bit of that demand has been um, supplanted with reclaimed water demand. So it's had a significant impact on the resiliency for our community. Um, so earlier in the in in the presentation, I talked about partnership and how important that can be for um, driving sustainability projects. Because when you start to broaden, you know, your criteria out and pull back and include different stakeholders and what their benefits are, and you start thinking about, you know, the how do you make the pie? How do you, you don't just divide up the pie? How do you make the pie bigger? Um, there becomes an opportunity um, for financial contributions. Um, and actually, the University of North Carolina paid for the entire reclaimed water system. Um, we helped them out with, with the design, um, but ultimately they covered um, over $10 million of capital costs because it checked so many of their boxes and, it, and it ultimately it was a... Um, a business decision for them. Uh, they expected um, a return on investment uh, in four to ten years. Uh, this just shows um, you know, where that was coming from. Water rates were increasing annually. We have seasonal rate structures. Um, they currently pay, you know, currently all non-residential customers pay $8.47 per thousand gallons in the summer and $4.46 per thousand gallons um, in the cooler months. UNC is paying 60 cents per thousand gallons uh, for the reclaimed water. So um, quite a discount for them um, for 800,000 gallons, you know, an average of 800,000 gallons um, a year or a month, excuse me. Uh, they do have a base charge um, because you know we are cost of service and this is a, a specialized system. Um, but that being said, they expected a return on investment for four to ten years. Interestingly enough, when I circled back with my colleagues in preparing for this, and I said, "Hey, so what did it turn out to be? We're ten years away from it. It's 2019. Did they get the ROI?" And um, and it seems like I'm not sure that that we're not aware of that analysis being done. So. That's a plug for the EFC. I think it's a great line for you guys to look into some of these big projects and how did they pan out? Did they pan out as expected? Uh, we, we were able to get some other funding for the project. Um, we got $1.8 million from the Clean Water Management Trust Fund grant, which is a North Carolina-based grant uh, for clean water projects. And we got $625,000 from the EPA. Um, so you know, making the pie bigger. Lots of folks were interested in it. It, it hit a lot of criteria. Um, so just kind of, a, you know, summary, I think, I hope I gave you some good examples of how sustainability can be baked into programmatic, programmatic design, implementation, operational decisions, capital projects. And um, I didn't have time to talk about, you know, long-term plans, but certainly those are a great opportunity to, to bring in these um, multi multi criteria analysis, and then just in terms of, you know, what are the lessons learned for small systems? Um, I realize probably most of you all don't have a sustainability manager, no matter how holistically interpreted my job may be. Um, you know, at the end of the day, that that is my job. Um, so how you know how can you make this simple? Um, or what are some, some tricks? So one, I would say always compare your decisions to the status quo. I mean, that may be a no-brainer, but um, that both um, helps drive change if it's needed, and it helps you um, see the good things about what you're doing already. Acknowledge that. Um, 
also acknowledging sustainability programs can save projects, can save money, and it's good to run them through these, you know, life cycle analysis. Um, but that's not necessarily the only reason to pursue um, sustainability projects, energy saving projects, um, you know, flood resilience projects. I mean, there's a lot of other re reasons to pursue these types of things. And sometimes you have to spend money to reach your goals. Um, and and why would sustainability projects necessarily be any different um, in that regard? Again, you know, drawing a big fence line and those partnerships can help attract funding and broaden the perspective of the project. Um, and then, you know, kind of a final thing, just to kind of simplify, it's not, you know, it kind of helps to keep it easy. You don't have to worry about quantifying every factor. Um, you know, sometimes just lining up your decisions uh, beside one another against those criteria is really what you need to, to move forward on certain projects. So I think with that, um, this is my contact information. You're welcome to reach out if you have any questions. I think there's going to be some time for questions, and I'll um, turn it over to Brandy. Hi, can you guys see my screen and hear me okay? Yep, you're all good. Awesome. Thanks, Tess. Well, thank you, Mary, for sharing that really great case study of how uh, OWSA has really sort of embraced embedding sustainability within their processes and decision-making framework. Um, as you mentioned, sort of towards the end of your presentation, um, it can be sometimes different for smaller, uh, maybe rural systems uh, throughout the country who are facing the significant uh, management and operational challenges without as much capacity. And so what the rest of today's presentation is really going to do is just touch on a few resources that are available free to water utilities to, to actually start to think through and uh, go through some of the processes that OWSA went through, um, but with their own uh, utilities and using uh, various frameworks that might be downscaled or just easy to access. All right. Let's see. Here we go. So um, the, the first tool that we wanted to share was really um, this Rural and Small Systems Guidebook to Sustainable Utility Management. Uh, this is an EPA guidebook which helps uh, small water and wastewater systems uh, in their common mission to become more successful and efficient at being service providers. Uh, the guidebook is designed really to introduce uh, small water and wastewater systems to the key areas of effectively managed systems to help small water and wastewater systems address many ongoing challenges and move towards sustainable management of both operations and infrastructure. So if you're starting off and you, as Mary mentioned, you might not have a sustainability director or manager within your utility, um, or you've never really thought about this and you're trying to understand like, how do I even start to conceptualize the issues of embedding sustainability into your water management system? Uh, this guidebook can be really helpful. It helps you think about um, product quality and customer satisfaction, financial viability and operational resiliency. Um, so it provides you sort of background information on all 10 key management areas listed here, um, as well as really detailed instructions and assistance on how to conduct a system assessment. And so for each one of these 10 key management areas, it helps sort of guide you through this checklist so you can think about um, where you stand and how sustainable you are within each of these management areas. Uh, the, t the guidance document, the report, really provides really great worksheets for you to work through this. If, uh, like I said, you don't have a sustainability manager, but you're looking to, to start embedding sustainability and integrating it into your process, it provides really great action plan worksheets that talk about what sort of strategies you might want to take and think about in order to improve your uh, sustainability. And then it has a very extensive list of resources, both for rural and small water systems. And so, um, this is sort of uh, a little bit of an older tool, but if you haven't seen it or used it yet, this is something you might want to look into. Um, when Tess sends out the PowerPoint presentation uh, in the resources section, we'll have a link to this so you can look at it and see whether it's an appropriate tool for your system. So another framework or approach that is being uh, discussed more and more every day is what's called the one water approach. So uh, this framework, the One Water Framework, uh, also known as Integrated Water Management Approach, really is um, thinking about managing water resources to optimize across departmental and multi-jurisdictional uh, areas 
and to think about management of water infrastructure from sort of a holistic perspective. Uh, so through integrated water management, communities seek to ensure enough clean water to meet the needs of both human and natural communities. And it thinks about how, you know, Mary had mentioned that they were approached by the university to think about uh, reclaimed water, right? That was thinking about how does our wastewater affect our drinking water and how can we start to manage these two things together? So that's how the one water approach sort of looks at things. Um, and it considers sort of the full urban water cycle as a single integrated system uh, in which all urban water flows are recognized as potential resources. And so the interconnectedness of those water supplies from groundwater to stormwater and wastewater is optimized and then they're combined uh, to impact um, and, and hopefully become more efficient with regard to managing water quality, wetlands, uh, estuaries, and the coast. Um, so while smaller water systems may not be inclined to start thinking about things holistically, they might just be really uh, focused on the day-to-day. -day. When you start to um, consider who are the other players within your region working on water and how can the actions that they're taking benefit you, maybe help reduce your rates uh, and vice versa, what can you do to help sort of the drinking water for your wastewater or wastewater for your drinking water, this is an approach that's really sort of taking off and, and worth taking a look at. And so I did want to provide sort of, in the one water world, one of the things that's really important is thinking about protecting your headwaters and how that could really impact your community at large. And so a really great case study on that, um, what I like to call a tale of two cities actually occurred in um, the Otter Creek region um, in uh, Vermont. And so there were these two towns that were uh, around the Otter Creek, uh, it's Rutland and Middlebury, and Rutland had significant development and had not taken steps to protect the headwaters, whereas Middlebury um, had really ambitious headwater protection goals and had maintained the wetlands. And so in, and so in 2011, uh, when Hurricane Irene came through that area, or Tropical Storm Irene came through that area, uh, Rutland experienced incredibly severe um, flash floods and property damage and all sorts of issues. And so this was a huge concern. Whereas Middlebury, who had actually done the protections of the uh, headlands, the, the water um, sources, they were um, actually able to see a huge benefit. They didn't suffer the same sort of uh, flood damage. And it's assumed that they were able to diminish their damages in the town of Middlebury by about 84 to 95%, saving them potentially like $1.8 million in flood damage. And so while this isn't directly speaking to how the utilities fared, it is an example of how um, thinking about water comprehensively can really impact the community at large. So another example um, that actually led to a really great resource um, that is free and available to all water systems is um, in Barrick, Maine. So in Barrick, Maine, they have about a system that pumps um, about 150,000 gallons of water a day, um, and they service about 900 accounts. So it's a fairly small system, and it includes residential, commercial, industrial, and government users. And so they were really struggling thinking about flood resilience as you know the climate starts to change and we experience more and more floods. This was part of their sustainability plan. And they were really trying to tackle like, well, how do we actually make sure that we're fortified and protected from flood damage? And so they partnered with the EPA and examined, did an on-site assessment of their facilities. Uh, they examined FEMA flood maps, identified vulnerable equipment, and evaluated possible mitigation measures. Um, this stepwise approach provided a solid basis for actions and recommendations that they were able to adopt. And with that assessment in hand, uh, they were able to implement several low-cost actions to build flood resilience. Um, so they, they had some short-term mitigation measures, which included things like placing sandbags at utility entryways, installing backflow preventers on low-lying overflow pipes, and securing or elevating chemical tanks to prevent floating. Um, but they also had some longer-term measures um, which haven't been implemented yet, but they're starting to work on implementing them into their capital improvement program um, and really sort of like partnering with the local government to make sure that communication between the utilities and the government is um, sort of free flowing and open. So one of the, the cool things that came out of this was the flood resilience 
uh, a basic guide for water and wastewater utilities. So Barrick was sort of a case study for how a small water system, whether you're drinking water or wastewater, can really walk through this process in order to build your own resilience and help you become more sustainable into the future. So this particular uh, guide is useful, again, for small and medium utilities, and it provides easy to use worksheets, which I think are really um, quite great. And so it takes you through the four steps, right? Understanding the threat, identifying potential consequences, where are you vulnerable, and then identifying mitigation measures, and then actually developing the plan. So this, again, has excellent worksheets that you can actually walk through that take you question by question to really help you think through this process. Again, if you don't have a sustainability director, this is something that can really walk you through the process, easy to use, and you can just um, take that tool and implement the strategies that it recommends. There are a few other um, uh, tools that I just wanna highlight quickly um, before we get to the questions uh, section, the Q&A section. Um, and so that's one, if you're, if you're trying to dig deeper into the climate resilience, um, of your utility, check out the EPA tool Crete. It's um, an online tool that really helps you think through your utility's needs and provides specific recommendations with regards to the threats and vulnerabilities that you might be facing in your region. There's also a really great climate ready water utilities guidebook that walks through various costs of different strategies that might be influencing you depending on what region you are throughout the country. And then one of the things that I know Mary and I talked about when we were thinking about this webinar was really the importance of building buy-in from ratepayers. And so there are some very great water utility public awareness kits out there that you can tap into. And so if you don't have the capacity to build your own internal marketing um, material, there are tools out there that you can just sort of adopt on your own and start sending out to your ratepayers so that you can sort of uh, educate them on the importance of water and water utilities and how that impacts your everyday life in order to help them understand, you know, some of the goals you might be setting or some of the strategies you might be adopting. Here's another really great uh, tool that you might be able to use if you're interested in doing some outreach to community members and hosting webinars or workshops with them. Uh, the Community-Based Water Resiliency Guide from EPA really helps uh, sort of do the train the trainer of water utility um, operators so that you can go out and do your community outreach on your own. And then last but not least, um, always making sure that you plug into information sharing and support systems um, like the WARN network um, or the Water Information Sharing and Analysis Center. And as you know, this, is a, this current webinar is being hosted by the EFCN and so check out their website for blogs on various water utility issues. Um, we also have a funding table by state. So if what you're looking for is, you know, what sort of funding is available for you in your state, uh, the funding table has a really great breakdown depending on where you are in the state. Um, and then you're welcome to request technical assistance. So yeah, so with uh, the last 10 minutes, we're gonna go ahead and just open it up to questions. Uh, feel free to chat and type them in the chat box. Um, I know Mary provided a lot of information and I just sort of sped through those tools and resources, but we'd love to hear from you all now. If I could jump in for a second, Brandy, um, since you mentioned the technical assistance, uh, we always like to give people the opportunity um, on our webinars to actually tell us if they need assistance. So we're just gonna show a quick poll uh, you heard a lot of a lot about different resources today, and you heard from some great speakers. So, if this is something that you think you'd like to think about more, someone like Brandy um, or like myself could uh, set up a time to speak with you and show you how to use some of these tools. Um, so, go ahead and let us know here. And if that is something that you do want more information about, we can contact you directly. All right, so it looks like almost everyone has responded, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll, and I'll let you get back to questions. Oh, thank you, Tess. So, Mary, there's a, there's a question for you. So, you have, you started off the conversation with regards to the board of directors having set very ambitious energy management goals, and so one of the questions being asked is, what were the drivers behind those, that goal setting? Um, and then how would you recommend a smaller utility engage their decision makers to consider adopting goals of that nature? 
That's a that's a really great question, and I wish I had been here at the time when they when they developed that goal to have a a really good insight into that. But um, it the drivers for that, you know, from my understanding, came from uh, a commitment to you know sustainability um, and kind of looking around at other local governments that were making these like you know very big pledges, you know, 100% um, you know off the grid and so our board asked staff, you know, what what is a, a realistic stretch goal um, to to reach for and to start to organize um, our work around energy? So we had we had done, um, as I mentioned before, we had made some some pretty significant investments in energy, and so it, they kind of wanted just a more formal um, stretch goal and. You know, another thing is the the cost control. When we look at our operating budget, um, you know, what are what are the costs in our operating budget that um, are significant that we can start to get a handle on? Um, and none of our projections for our energy program are energy costs going down um, in the future. And so, um, you know, I know that that has been you know a continued important consideration for our energy management efforts. Um, so, yeah, I, I think some, uh, you know, in terms of how to, to, to parlay that into your own communities, um, you know, some early wins, early successes, um, and, and getting folks excited about it um, can, can be helpful. And then there are also, you know, I'm, I'm sure that the EFCN has a lot of resources on this, but like public-private partnerships, um, where you don't have to take as much of the um the risk yourself so there's um um escos energy service companies that will actually invest in the energy efficiency and and you just reduce your bill um so there's some models like that that can help um move move a type of initiative forward excellent and so another question that was asked was with regard to the evaluation criteria that you described um, how frequently do you go through the evaluation process? Is that every year with the capital plan? And then how long does it normally take you to get through that evaluation criteria? It seems like there's a lot of background research that has to be done. Mm -hmm. um, so for the energy management program, which is an iterative and ongoing program, um, we do work through that every year. Um, the first year, it was pretty, it was a heavy lift. <laughs> Um, we had um, over 35 identified projects, and and part of another part of having that that filter of criteria, if you will, was that it allowed um, no idea was a bad one. You know, bring all of your ideas forward, which helped to get uh, board members and staff involved in identifying ideas. So we we did have a lot of projects to evaluate. Um, and we had a, a kind of a common framework to evaluate it. So I had some help on that one. In later years, um, it has not been such a heavy lift to work through that criteria. And we have a, um, an energy team that gets together once a year from across the organization. And we discuss the projects uh, that we're thinking about. And that they really help uh, consider the project from different angles. And again, it's not um, it's not super quantitative. It's a lot of well, you know, I think this is going to be the case, and then um, and then we discuss whether we want to implement it, study it, defer indefinitely, um, or um, defer until upgrade. And um, and and so in, in subsequent years, it's been a lot easier uh, to to work through that. Excellent. And I think we have one more question, and I know we're, we're running up on time. So the last question was, you talked about the reclaimed water system and how the uh, UNC approached um, you all to partner on that. And so what advice would you give to a water system who may be interested in partnering with either, if they're a drinking water system, a wastewater system, or vice versa? Um, yeah, what advice would you give to someone looking to partner outside of their own sector? Um. I would say, you know, kind of broaden that, um, broaden your perspective uh, and start to think about it, you know, from, from their side of things and, you know, nurture relationships 
in the community. That may sound kind of cheesy, but a lot of um, kind of good ideas can come from just maintaining those relationships and, and understanding um, where folks are coming and what their what their drivers are. Um, we just went through a process. You know, I brought up our long range water supply plan. Um, but as we're planning, you know, 50 years out into the future and how we're going to meet the demands of our community, um, we want to include demand side management and uh, beyond the reclaimed water system that we already have. And so we um, we had uh, brainstorming meetings with some of our largest customers, the university included, but also the towns which have um, you know jurisdiction over businesses and and um, and residential customers and we just again kind of brainstormed what are your big hairy ideas for how we could meet demand um, in 50 years you know it doesn't necessarily have to be something that's technically you know right now on the ground feasible or that is cost effective right now but you know if we're going to line up some of um, you know if, if we have to supplement our supply some of those options can get pretty um, complicated and pretty expensive and so it doesn't become such a far reach to consider you know expansion of the reclaimed water system or on-site um, water reuse strategies and so if you kind of consider that long time frame um, you know and and have a process where you can invite those really you know hairy ideas um, in partnership with your community um, and then you can can kind of work through those. So, um, you know, again, it, a lot of it comes to, from relationships and understanding and kind of getting early buy-in um, on, on these projects. Well, thank you so much, Mary, for the presentation and for all the advice and lessons learned you've been able to share today. Um, and thank you all for joining us on this webinar. This has been great. Uh, hopefully, we've learned a little bit about how um, one can integrate sustainability into their decision-making process. And hopefully you've learned about a few new resources that you can implement within your own water utility to make that process a little bit more seamless. So I believe Tess will be sending out the uh, presentations later. Feel free to reach out to Mary or myself um, if you have any questions. And we hope that you get to join us for our future webinars. Thanks, Brandy. Goodbye, everybody.